I often follow your posts on Facebook and, and I read what people are posting. And, you know, as I was saying, sometimes I just want to shout into my computer. No, no, this is a good thing. This is a good thing. <laughs> um, because what I see a lot is a sense of people going through crises of I can't do and I can't maintain and I'm not meeting expectations and I don't feel successful. And that's creating an understandable crisis. But I think in the midst of that crisis or as that crisis emerges, people are seeing those things as negatives, as I'm failing rather than, okay, I've got this great opportunity now that this particular structure that's been holding me up, yeah, uh, what would be called a psychic structure, it crumbles in the crisis. And now you have the opportunity to rebuild it um, at a level that's more consistent with your values. You're listening to the Brave OT Podcast with me, Carlin Neek. This podcast is all about empowering occupational therapists to step up, level up, blaze some trails, and maybe engage in a little conscious rebellion in service of our profession, our clients, our work, our businesses, and living our mission wholeheartedly. We are all about keeping it real, doing hard things, unhustling, being curious, exploring, growing through our challenges, and finding joy, fulfillment, and vitality as we do so. Really, we're OTing ourselves and each other. I hope you love this episode. It was such a delight to listen back to this interview that I did earlier this year with Hal. He was my kid's elementary school principal and has become a friend and wonderful supporter. He also made the music that is the intro and outro of this podcast. So that's a little personal touch here for you. But in this conversation, if you are a person who experiences big feelings, deep thinking, sees things in layers of complexity, and that makes life a little bit challenging for you sometimes, stick around. You're going to learn a lot. Do you want to tell us a little bit about who you are? I'm a school principal in an elementary school for gifted kids right now. And you were my children's principal. That's how, yeah, that's how we got to know each other. I, I'm about to walk through the door of uh, retirement and into the next phase of life. So I've been doing this for about 34 years. Probably the last 20 of the 34 years were focused on gifted learners and teaching and learning with gifted kids which is how I, I came to the theory of positive disintegration when I was doing my graduate work uh, in gifted education. So this theory tends to connect with the gifted world pretty solidly. Yeah, there's a lot in there that Dabrowski's theory of positive disintegration. I find when I start to talk to, I get really excited, a little bit overexcited <laughs> when talking to <laughs> adults who very clearly are presenting with some of those benefits and challenges that come with giftedness. Cause you're like, mm -hmm. oh, you need to know about this. And I start talking about this theory and people's eyes kind of glaze over. And I think it's really juicy and interesting. So I think we can present some of the ways that we can understand ourselves a little bit better as adults, perhaps as parents, as therapists who help children who are showing up with some of the difficulties that, that it poses alongside of the positives. Could you tell us a little bit more about that, how you would define giftedness? Giftedness in a classical sense, in a sort of data sense is really, if you think of the average population having a, an IQ score of a hundred, mm -hmm. giftedness is about 130 plus or minus five. So people who fit into that category are sort of the uh, top 2% on a bell curve. But I prefer to think of giftedness as a series of personal characteristics that create a sort of a different experience of the world. And that's what's important in our work. If you look at it strictly as an IQ thing, then there's a tendency to look at it as a defining giftedness by what people can achieve or by what they can do. Um, if you look at it in the terms of the individual characteristics, you look at it through the lens of how being gifted creates a different experience of the world for you. And as educators and as parents, we have to make some adjustments to how we raise kids and how we educate them in schools. 
Mm -hmm. What are some of those characteristics? I'm thinking for a lot of the listeners, they may be parents and therapists to children who are gifted, but they may also not realize their own gifted traits as adults who may not have been identified as a younger person as such. Well, in kids, we often look at things like asynchrony. So it's possible to be cognitively 15 years old and emotionally five years old. And in terms of your physical development, eight years old. So it's possible to be all of those three things, which creates a challenge for kids who are perceiving the world more like adolescents, but having emotional experiences more like five-year-olds. In terms of the adult experience, giftedness comes with a big set of expectations. So they may have grown up under this sort of weight of, I'm expected to be able to do A, B, and C. There tends to be a sense of perfectionism that the standards are set really high. So it's difficult sometimes when you don't feel that you're meeting your, your own standards or the standards uh, people have set for you. Sometimes your sense of that is a little stronger than what people have actually set for you. So um, you set your goals fairly high and uh, the possibility of not meeting those expectations also comes with that sort of risk of not being gifted, not uh, being capable. Uh, of doing the things that you or other people expect you to be capable of doing. So things like the imposter syndrome come into play there. Gifted people tend to experience the world differently in terms of their overexcitability. So their sensory receptors tend to be a little more active. Their nervous systems are a little more alive. And that can look like physical overexcitability or an intellectual overexcitability or an emotional overexcitability. So those kinds of things can create some issues. Um, thinking of people in theaters who uh, have had this experience with a friend of mine who had a particular uh, point in a movie uh, where it was emotionally really intense, just jumped up and said, oh, I don't think I can stay in here. Um, and that is kind of an involuntary response. Uh, that can sometimes create difficulties or people who cry easily during movies or cry easily when music uh, is played um, in settings where that can be uncomfortable if people don't understand it. Also, the intellectual overexcitability, sometimes the world doesn't make sense to you in the way that you think it should, and that can create some difficulties too. And frustrations, like why can't... The other people see what I see here. Don't you see <laughs> there's a disaster coming or that there's well, another there's way? The, yeah, there's the sense of why don't people see the way I see it. And there's also the sense of why am I not like other people? Mm -hmm. You know, so if, if you're 13 years old and you're sitting in a movie in your classroom and all of a sudden you start crying and you can't control it, that can become uncomfortable. And you wonder, why do I do this? And why are other people not this way? So. Um, it's kind of, you know, giftedness can be like a double-edged sword. It's, and, and you have to see the, the potential and the good in it and also appreciate how it can create difficulties. Mm -hmm. Yes. I definitely see in a lot of the adults that I work with who are gifted, that sense of, I have this capacity or potential and they might not call it gifted, but that they know that they are capable of more because Sometimes they perform at more, but that more actually isn't sustainable. We can't always perform at that peak level. That doesn't even make sense. But that mm -hmm. sense that anything between where I on average perform and where I'm capable of being that sort of efforting, like just do, 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 go, go, go. And that there must be kind of this, I can finally rest when I'm performing at this level all the time. And mm -hmm. that is exhausting. And <laughs> it's people at risk for burnout and yeah. never feeling good enough. I think also what's key is whether or not performing at that high level is something that you've chosen for yourself. Or is it something that other people have chosen for you? and you feel responsible to meet their expectations. Um, oftentimes that's where a crisis emerges. 
um, when you just feel like you're not able to meet other people's expectations um, and you sort of disintegrate around that crisis and you rebuild yourself in terms of what are my expectations of myself? What's realistic for me? What's important to me? And how do I want to function in the world as opposed to how do other people want me to function in the world? Mm. I think a lot of people don't even recognize that they think it's their own standard, but it's mm. sort of this ingrained something else that's a remnant from what others expected of them previously. And while rationally in this moment, they're not necessarily having those expectations, but they just don't even know another way of being in the world because that's sort of how they were socialized or programmed or mm. that they were other people's expectations, but they persist into their own somehow. I think that's true in terms of how you start off in a career as an adult. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that, you know, teachers are not too dissimilar to occupational therapists in that you're responding to your training initially and your training tells you that this is what you should do and this is what other OTs are doing, but something just doesn't quite seem right to you. And, you know, for a while you go along with the expectation that you think is the standard by which OTs are judged, but it just doesn't work for you. It doesn't jive with your value system or your beliefs. And that can create a crisis as well, where you just say, okay, I can't do this anymore. And that crisis, and this is kind of where the theory of positive disintegration comes in. Society tends to view those crises where you just can't function anymore as negatives. In the theory of positive disintegration, those crises are positives because they provide the opportunity for, for growth, for personality growth, for self-realization and for authenticity to be able to live your life the way you believe it should be lived rather than being guided by what we often call the herd, mm -hmm. just following the herd without questioning. You, when you and I talked about you coming onto the podcast, one of the triggers was some of your observations of interactions in my social media. Yeah, do you want to talk a little bit about what you observe? Oh, yeah. I often follow your posts on Facebook and, and I see, I read what people are posting. And, you know, as I was saying, sometimes I just want to shout into my computer. No, no, this is a good thing. This is a good thing. <laughs> um, because what I see a lot is a sense of people going through crises of I can't do and I can't maintain and I'm not meeting expectations and I don't feel successful and that's creating an understandable crisis. But I think in the midst of that crisis or as that crisis emerges, people are seeing those things as negatives, as I'm failing rather than, okay, I've got this great opportunity now that this particular structure that's been holding me up, yeah. uh, what would be called a psychic structure, it crumbles in the crisis. And now you have the opportunity to rebuild it um, at a level that's more consistent with your values. Sometimes, you know, in a crisis, you move ahead or you develop, or sometimes you go back to, you just say, well, okay, I will just compromise my values because it's easier to live that way. But a lot of people have a hard time doing that. Uh, and shut that up and play the game. Sort shut of up thing. and play the game. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, don't make waves, but you know, that doesn't work for everybody. And in, in the posts that I see on your Facebook page, I often see those sentiments reflected and, and I really want to say, okay, just stop for a minute and stop judging yourself and see the opportunity to look at what you're going through and look at how that can be turned into a positive for you and how you can begin to rebuild your psychic structures around what you believe are authentic to you. Mm -hmm. So it's really a way of assuming some control of your own development. And this is different from positive thinking or like the, you know, silver lining. I know we're going to talk about positive disintegration, which is that main framework we're going to look at. But I think about growth mindset. I think about post-traumatic growth. 
these things where when things fall apart is where the growth happens, where we learn so much in the rebuilding, like tearing things down to rebuild them better, falling apart to come back together in a more authentic way. Very different from, oh, look on the bright side, you're growing. Yeah. Well, you know, sometimes adjusting how you see your experience is an encouragement for you to not change your circumstance, mm -hmm. but just to see it in a different way. Mm -hmm. And I think in terms of positive disintegration, what you're changing is your internal psychic structure. You're changing your whole sort of developmental skeleton, if you will, rather than just staying where you are and just deciding I'm going to look at it in a different way. I, you know, I mean, there's a great place for that. There's a wonderful book by uh, the Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu um, where they talk about their experiences and things that they are able to change, which does require a different perspective. Theory of positive disintegration is really about seeing the things that you can change and comparing what is, which is often what brings about the crisis and comparing that to what ought to be, you know, when you have that strong sense of what ought to be, and you're driven towards that, it does create these disintegrations as you decide that you have to live your life in a different way. And that means that you have to rebuild the psychic structures that the crisis broke down. So these disintegrations are sort of like where you're feelings like you are psychically integrated at the end. Dabrowski talks about the levels, so we can get into mm -hmm. those levels. And a disintegration is where you're sort of coming apart a little bit. There's things are, the wheels are coming off the bus. It, it, yeah. it feels like a crisis, right? Quite often triggered by a more specific crisis, whether that's external. Tell us a little bit about these levels. I think that's a framework that's really helpful to understand. Well, there's, there's two terms that are that you need to understand one is integration and one is disintegration so the first level is a primary integration so it's very instinctive and it starts off with your need as a baby to nurse and to do things that are instinctual that are going to allow you to survive um, as you get older you develop um, a sense of I have to do what's expected or I have to do what the herd is doing. I have to do what is the societal norm. I have to follow that. And you're integrated in that level. So it's not questioned. Which and is also then, safety and survival oriented, right? If oh, you're yeah. aligned with your group, then you're safe. Yeah. Yeah. There's a sense of safety there and a sense of familiarity. So I know how to progress in this world. I just have to do these things. And doing these things isn't questioned in terms of, is that consistent with my values? Um, and then you get to the first level of disintegration, which is a uni level disintegration level two, where you begin to become aware of other possibilities. In the second level, those other possibilities have the same value in terms of your moral belief system. And the crisis in the second level is that it's hard for you to decide which is more important. When you get to the third level, it's not so much a horizontal comparison, but a vertical. All of a sudden, certain values are more uh, a higher level value than others. So you start to look at what is and compare it to what could be and what could be takes on more significance in terms of your moral sense. Then you move from the third level to the fourth level, which is where you build a hierarchy of values that you use to guide how you live your life. So you become authentic around in that sense of, I live according to my values. You know, when you talk about it in terms of numbers, it sounds quite easy, but it takes a lot of energy. There's a lot of crises. Then you get to the fifth level, the secondary integration. So you're integrated once again, in terms of, I have a value structure that guides my life that I don't question. And my value structure is really based on awareness of the needs of other people and a consistent drive towards what ought to be rather than what it is. Less sort of ego driven. It's less about you. You're showing up authentically as you, but yeah. 
it's not a me phase like some of the the earlier yeah the earlier phase like level one is really it's all about me and level five is really me has to be taken into consideration in terms of other people's needs being met so there's a there's a need to meet the needs of others and that's seen as important as almost as important or as important as meeting your own needs whereas at the first level or the lower levels meeting your own needs is more important than meeting the needs of others and we don't go through these phases like just a typical development that you're going to start at one and end up at five enlightened and integrated yeah. if you take your dog for a walk and you look back on your footprints where you've walked in a straight line and your dog has been all over the place development kind of takes that trajectory as you know as you move into higher levels you go kind of back and forth. Um, you have these crises where sometimes you identify a value structure that is vertical. Well, this is more important than that. Um, and then you get to a, a point where you can't decide which is more important, which is more of a, a level two. In my experience, you bounce back and forth all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you think, okay, I have a level four hierarchy of values. But then you recognize that you're doing things that aren't consistent with your hierarchy of values. So you're back again into the level three. So it's kind of back and forth. And I think you begin to appreciate that as a natural experience of positive disintegration that rather than a, a linear step-by-step -step towards level five. And Dabrowski and Maslow were, they knew each other, right? They were developing these theories a little bit in parallel, not parallel theories, they're different, but there's that similarity in a sense of getting to a place where self-actualization is what Maslow would call it, mm -hmm. which is not equal to that secondary integration, that fifth level. It's interesting to think about them in a little bit of similarity, a little bit of overlap. Yeah, I'm not an expert on Maslow, but I kind of understand that Typically, most people reach uh, those levels that Maslow describes. Yeah. Um, in terms of Dabrowski, about 80% of people live their lives at level one, and uh, the other 20% are in that disintegration process, and they have that strong internal drive to move towards what ought to be rather than to be content in the what is. So if a person is finding themselves in this sort of crisis that might feel a little bit existential. It might feel a little bit like, who am I? How do I fit in the world? What do I care about? I don't feel aligned with the things I used to feel aligned with. I know Dabrowski talks about auto psychotherapy. And what are some things we could do as adults who might be in these crises? Questions we might ask ourselves to help us through. Oh, that's a great question. I think having some familiarity with Dabrowski's levels and then doing things like journaling, writing your own personal biography, how you got to where you were, or uh, journaling around where you are and what the processes are that you find yourself engaged in at that point and comparing them to the levels that Dabrowski talks about in the theory looking at the biographies of other people, comparing your experience to the experiences of other people is a good way of developing a sense of how I guide myself or how I work myself through this process. So auto psychotherapy, as I understand it, is really about becoming aware of your own experience and guiding your own experience. So through self-reflection, looking at an experience and saying, okay, here's what I did. Is that consistent with my values? If it is, why? And what's positive about that? Or if it isn't, what value do I have that's in conflict with? So auto psychotherapy is really about taking control of your own trajectory in terms of developing that personality ideal. In Dombrowski, in terms of a therapist's goal is really to make themselves redundant. A therapist sees their role as putting you on a, a trajectory where you don't need them anymore. Mm -hmm. I love that. I definitely find that a lot of 
the OTs I work with would describe experiencing a lot of those overexcitabilities. They would often describe themselves as highly sensitive. Often mm-hmm. there is a aud- auditory sensitivity, tactile sensitivities, emotional sensitivities. I also work yeah. with a lot of OTs who have ADHD, which is interesting. <laughs> And I think you have to also have a certain capacity for creativity and intellect to succeed in this profession. And so I see this a lot where there is this crisis off in midlife somewhere there as well of this sense of, well, things don't fit anymore. I found the pandemic also was that we got out of our sort of occupational rhythms yeah. and changed things. And kind of as we emerged, we went, wait a minute, but I've become more me without the pressures of being something else and <laughs> wanting to know who am I because I don't fit things that used to fit. And often it is that sense of what are my values? What do I deeply care about? What makes me uniquely me? And how do I align what I'm doing, my occupations, with who I really am authentically? But there's that sense of needing to know yourself first. And there's a sense of, of crisis. If you think of puberty as a crisis where you move out of that, I need a roof over my head and I need uh, food and I need clothes to what do I want to be and how do I want to be and what are other people doing and how do I fit into that? And we probably both experienced in our teenage years being in conflict with something that everybody wanted to do, but going along with it because it was what everybody wanted to do. And at some point that doesn't work anymore. Menopause is sometimes a time of crisis or middle age is a a time where you reflect on where you are in terms of where you thought you would be or where you wanted to be. And and then you start asking questions about, well, where do I want to go? And what drives that response to where do I want to go? In that crisis, you really need to look inward and say, what are my values directing me? towards. You know, you have the option of saying, what's everybody else doing at 45? That's what I'll do. Or what do I want to do at 45? And why is that what I want to do? Coming to terms with that is a positive way out of a crisis. And again, it's, it's so important to see these crises as opportunities for growth and forward motion, as opposed to terrible things that happen to you that need to be fixed. It's very positive that way. Do you feel comfortable sharing any of your own personal experiences in disintegration? Oh, sure. You know, I remember in my graduate studies coming across the theory of positive disintegration. I think anybody who does a university degree or any kind of training where you get to the point where you think, I don't know if I can do this. This is too hard for me. Um, that can create a crisis. But for me, uh, theory of positive disintegration was really life changing because when you get to a point where you hit a personal limitation and you feel like you can't do it anymore, that creates a crisis. And if you see that crisis as terrible, you might say, I can't do this anymore. And I'm out. Retreat, retreat, retreat. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Or I think I can do this and I want to do this. And so I need to uh, develop that perspective that moves me forward. So, you know, again, it's that what is, I feel like I can't do this to what ought to be. This is what I want. Uh, so I can propel myself through that. I think, you know, anybody who's been married has hit a point in their relationship where they question, is this what I want? Can I do this? And what value either moves you out of it or what value keeps it in it and moves you forward in in a way that makes your relationship grow. Um, I think in terms of an occupation before I was in education, uh, I was in the construction and, uh, I just realized in a very powerful way that was not meeting almost any of my needs and that I wasn't really well suited for it. At that time I was married and I had children and when you decide I can't do this anymore and you have a marriage and you have children, that can create a crisis. Yeah. Moving yourself forward in a way that is consistent with your values and, and your dreams and, and what you want to achieve for yourself is really important. When you accept that you can do that and it's what you want and it's for good reasons and it's for 
noble reasons is a positive experience that comes out of a disintegration. And, you know, coming back to your posts on your Facebook page and the people that are following you, I just so often see that. And when I read some of those posts, I think, yeah, I've been there. Yeah, I've been there. And this theory helped me to see those things as positive rather than as, oh no, I don't want to do this anymore. What am I going to do? And we often, it's, it feels really hard to see it in the middle of the crisis. Like I'm thinking oh, yeah. about times we've talked about too, where it just feels like the world has fallen apart and what am I even doing? When the secondary level, the uni level disintegration were it's a horizontal kind of development when you're stuck between two choices. I can do this or I can do that. And I can't decide which to do. That often creates paralysis and yeah. uh, that sort of existential crisis. And you really feel stuck. Sometimes when I'm reading the posts on your Facebook page, I see people who are stuck. Yeah. Uh, and they're really struggling to choose between two things. And that's hard. That's a really hard place to be in. But once you start to think in terms of a vertical organization of, of values that this, in terms of, of my um, values and my development is more positive than the other or has more value or has a greater moral um, component to it than the first choice, that's, you know, kind of an important phase in the getting unstuck is where you start to see things as being more valuable than other things. I find it so exhilarating. I feel like I'm doing what I'm meant to do when I'm helping people through that spot or just being able to provide a bit of insight um, in that. When I made a shift in my business, um, it started with sitting down and reflecting. I did the Marie Kondo of my caseload and I went through <laughs> <laughs> all of my files and I picked yeah. them up and it was like, I, actually, I didn't pick them all up, but I flipped through and went which ones would I love to talk to again? Just like, how did I feel about and put those into a pile? And I looked at all this pile of 20 or so files and tried to figure out what they had in common. And most of them were super smart, super sensitive and super stuck. And once we got to this place of sort of just unpacking things enough that they could see it, like they ran off and did amazing things. And it's really fun because you can kind of get into some really interesting exploration and deep dives and expansion and geeking out in some places. And then people just start to light up and something clicks and they find their way. Yeah. It really is exhilarating. And, you know, I had a similar experience when I was working in construction, coming to the point where I realized that this didn't speak to me in any kind of a way. I wasn't where I wanted to be. I wasn't doing what I wanted to do. It didn't feel like it had value. And at 28, I went back to university and I had my first teaching job at 32. And I remember exactly where I was and exactly what I was doing when a light went on in my head. And it was just like, oh, I am exactly where I want to be doing exactly what I want to do. And that is so life-changing. I had to go through that crisis in order to get to that point. You know, it happened to me again when I was doing my grad studies where for the first time in my life, I felt fully engaged in my university experience. Mm. Working where I work with the population that I work with, I have a really strong sense of mission that I'm working with people who are often very misunderstood and often as a result of being misunderstood, we're not meeting their needs. We're not serving them well. For those people, having their needs met and being understood is absolutely life-changing. I often say to teachers, this is a life-changing moment where you changed this person's life. You made a difference. I sometimes get little thank you cards from people who say, our child finding their place in the world has made a difference to our entire family. And so I think in terms of your OT experience and the experience of other people that I follow on your Facebook page, sometimes they're at that point where am I making a difference in anyone's life? Is this fulfilling to me? Do I feel a sense of purpose? And at that point, your psychic structures can break down and you have the opportunity to rebuild them so that 
you are doing what you feel you ought to be doing rather than just doing what you're doing without question. It's very, very powerful. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you have to see that opportunity in the crisis as opposed to just being completely shut down by the crisis. You know, it's so interesting. So in learning about marketing an online offer, the idea is the tricky part is that people often have a sense of what they think they need mm -hmm. that's different from what they actually need. And the marketing needs to be helping them see themselves in the thing that they think that they're looking for, but then make a small belief shift to see that what they need for a solution might be a little bit different than what they thought. I find a lot of the OTs who are going through these crises are thinking they need more business coaching, more clinical skills, more courses, another degree. And education is fantastic. I love education. But often mm -hmm. that's not actually what they need. They need to pause and know themselves better and understand themselves better and understand what makes them tick and understand what is fulfilling and, and then move toward doing the things that move them there. I just it's hard to a, market. It is. And I, I had a thought as you were saying that, that auto psychotherapy or taking control of your own growth mm -hmm. in a way you might ask yourself, how would I market myself to myself? Mm -hmm. Would I find my, who I am, or would I find my brand to use a common phrase? Would I find my brand desirable or rewarding or with merit? And I think a lot of times what leads to a crisis is when you ask that question and you think, I wouldn't believe in myself as I am right now. I don't. And that brings about that crisis. And the opportunity is really through self-reflection and through moving uh, into the what ought to be, what do I want to be versus what I am. Um, you go through that process of looking at your own hierarchy of values. You have to, if you're starting at sort of level one, you have to be aware of the alternatives and then the alternatives have to be put in some sort of vertical arrangement. What is a higher level for me and what is a lower level? Then that is organized into a hierarchy of values. And then you really find yourself saying, this is who I am and these are my values and this is what I want to do. This is what I believe in and this is what I think I can offer to the world. And I think that's so critical for having a sense of what I do has worth rather than, well, I'm just doing what everyone does. I'm just following the herd, but it comes at a cost. I mean, going through that process is tricky. And I see a lot of the people who are Again, on your Facebook page, many of them, I imagine, are not at the beginning of a career. They're in the middle of a career. And making those shifts in the middle of a career is really tricky because you have financial responsibilities, you have clientele, you have people who depend on you. You have an identity as you one thing. You have an identity. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, you have to sort of change that identity. And I think the pandemic changed a lot of people's identities because they, either lost their jobs or they moved from, in terms of a teacher is trained to work in a classroom. And all of a sudden people at my school found themselves online without a lot of training. So that, that whole identity shift and I moved to online, you know, there was a lot of mm -hmm. trauma and existential crisis going on here, but as people had to. They were amazed at their own ability to adapt and, and to change. Um, for, for some people who are contemplating or who just don't feel like what they're doing gives them value in terms of what they think they ought to be doing, making that change is difficult and it does create those crises. But again, uh, seeing it as a positive opportunity rather than a, a problem that says you're broken and you need to be fixed. Um, and I think it, there's a parallel I've seen as well, where you've talked about those letters you've seen from families where they said, my mm -hmm. kid found their place in the world. We hear it a lot at the school around, you know, found my people. I finally found my people. There's only 2% of us in this world. And to find each other is really validating. I've found that in helping the OTs I help in a group, that there is that sense of 
other people who are on this similar journey of Mm self-discovery and growing through the crisis and figuring themselves out and being able to reflect that back in a group of kind, sensitive souls who will see you and validate you and and remind you of the values you've already identified or point out opportunities to expand and consider and question. I think what's wonderful about your work, and you and I have had some conversations about your work, is that in a sense, you become a guide. Mm -hmm. So people who are in crisis come to you and you say, okay, uh, where are you right now? Let's look at the options. Um, And in looking at the options, I imagine sometimes it's hard for them to decide which way they want to go. But then you help them to develop a sense of priority. So you sort of lead them from that level one crisis into a level two these are the options and into level three, this one seems to be more of a priority for me than the other. Then they organize their hierarchy of values and they move forward. So it just occurred to me that your work and the work of many occupational therapists is really guiding people through this process. I imagine most people come to you because of a crisis and the way you guide them through the crisis is to help them develop their own hierarchy of values. Um, I suppose I wouldn't use the word hierarchy typically, but it does fit when we look at it in terms of this model. Mm -hmm. It it does fit. It's sort of that sense of values in terms of not virtues, not the things that would be on a list of commandments, but the sense Mm -hmm. of who am I in this world and what do I care most deeply about as a unique individual? Um, Yeah. Really working on kind of getting curious about ourselves to find those things. And there may be some things that fit on a hierarchy, but I often haven't thought about it like that. I think in terms of a hierarchy, I could say, well, what can I do in my job? It's all about me. What can I do just for me? Or what can I do that's of value to others and me? So, you know, I think in terms of helping people decide which way they want to go, there's a certain amount of, do you want to just do what is important to you, which kind of led you into this crisis? Or do you want to do something that gives you a sense of value in terms of meeting the needs of others and meeting your own needs? So you kind of do develop that hierarchy. And, you know, if people came to you and you just said, these are the possibilities and they never chose, they'd be stuck. I, I kind of think that you and other OTs help people to get unstuck by showing them the opportunities and showing them the possibilities and helping them decide which way they're going to go. And probably there's some conversation about why do you want to go that way? Which means that they have to have a sense of their own value system. Indeed. Yeah. You really are like miracle workers in terms of the theory of positive. Who knew? Who knew? And and then, you know, you make it so that they don't need you anymore. So that it's very consistent with uh, the therapy that Dombrowski taught. Yeah. Yeah, it it is interesting when you could apply various theories on top of what you are already doing. I always find that really interesting Mm to go, oh, like you just find your way, right? And then you read this and you read that and you read different things and you can start to see how those things fit. And then I find I often expand into applying bits more of those things that can enhance Mm -hmm. the thing that I'm doing, but I don't typically start with the theory. No, but, it, you know, as we're talking, it there's a parallel. Mm-hmm, for sure. Yeah, that's yeah. really interesting. Yeah. You, to switch to something a little lighter, you are the person who made the music for my podcast. And I'm so grateful for that offer and that collaborative experience. Could you tell me a little bit more about you and music and where you're going and even just that experience of doing this project? Music for me has just been a, something that I felt driven to do since I was young. I think I got my first guitar when I was seven and I just, I felt compelled to play it. And, you know, there are times in my life where I've set it aside and not really played. And those times start to feel empty. Music again, for me was a vehicle for self-expression, but also for reaching out to people. Mm. And as an art, I've always questioned what's important about art. And I think what's important about art is being able to communicate uh, a feeling, a message, a thought, inviting people into a consideration of 
some aspect of the human condition. And so it's just something that I've always done. When the opportunity came to say, well, you know, I know that podcasts often have theme music. Yeah. Um, it really sort of meant a lot to me to be able to say, this is something I can do to say thank you to you for all of our conversations and all of what I've taken out of them. What's kind of meaningful for me in that sense to be able to offer it to people as a way of saying thanks. Oh, well, thank you. That's uh, it. Um, it felt really touching and it also helped to be to solidify it from being an idea mm -hmm. in the background to a real thing that I needed to follow through with because now it had a thing. It had a theme, it had a vibe, it needed a title. I ended up kind of coming to values as the way of deciding what to call it and what how to describe it by figuring out the values that I wanted to show up in it. It was interesting for me too, because as I was thinking about how am I going to do this, I thought this is going to be multi-layered and it's going to have all these instruments. And I, I kept <laughs> sending you all these things and you would say, nope, that's not quite it. Nope, that's not quite <laughs> it. And then you're, I, the simplest thing that I did, I said to you and you went, yep, that's it. <laughs> and I thought, it's really important to think about what is it that you're offering to someone? Is it what they want or is it what you want? Uh, is it what meets their needs or is it what meets your needs? So just in that simple process of selecting that little 20 second clip of music, mm -hmm. it was a lot of opportunity to reflect on what's it for and who is it for and what do they need rather than, oh, I want to do this. Which completely changes it. So as I do more visual arts, I was in an IB art program in high school and I did a lot of painting. Now I do more pottery. and any time I've tried to shift to make it for somebody else what they need, whether it was my grandfather asked me to draw a letterhead for his conscientious objectors camp newsletter. And I it just like this pressure for it to be what somebody else needed ma made me actually turn away from considering art as a career. And I've had people want to hire me to make custom pottery for different things. And I've tried it and I don't, I, I, it ceases to be enjoyable for me. So for me, that sense of art for someone else, I don't enjoy, which made it actually, do you remember, I wasn't very willing to give you feedback initially mm -hmm. because I didn't want to put a judgment on your art. And you said, no, that's the fun part of the process for me. Like, I want to make it suit you, um, mm -hmm. which is different from my experience with my art. I'm sure that you run across people who as they come out of a crisis, say, well, this is what I always wanted to do. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, for whatever reason, my parents told me I should, or I needed to make money, or, you know, they kind of set aside the thing that really fires them up. And one of the things I'm looking forward to in retirement is to be able to spend a lot more time doing those things that really sort of fire me up. Um, not that what I do doesn't, but, you know, there's only so many hours in the day and some things have to become more important than other things. But we see a lot of people who come out of that crisis and say, okay, I'm not going to keep doing this. I'm going to do this thing that I've always wanted to do that I set aside, which ultimately is a positive development in somebody's life, I would have to say. Yeah, it's true. You know, I was just going to say that in the theory of positive disintegration in that level five where people become integrated fully into their hierarchy of values comes art sometimes. And Dombrowski said that problem solving in art and art represent one of the highest and noblest values in, in life, a mm -hmm. uh, noble pursuit. Ironically, art isn't always that highly valued in society. Yeah. Uh, and so a lot of people set it aside. Yeah. I think it's probably easier to make a living as an OT, um, <laughs> and it is as a potter. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> Would you like people to be able to find your music, your, how could people reach out to you? Oh boy. Okay. So <laughs> if you have one of the streaming Spotify, for example, mm -hmm. you can find, I was in a group called Haird, which is a Celtic word. It's C-E-A-R-D. You can find that on Spotify. There's an album there that's on Spotify. There's some other pieces of music that I've co-written that are 
under the name of Willow Brock. Okay. B R O C K E. You can also find those on Spotify. Yeah. And would you be interested in producing little bits of music like you did for me for other people? Is that something you're considering? Oh, if people wanted it, I would certainly be open to that. I and mean, that's very exciting. And mm-hmm. it's, it's interesting that you said I didn't want to critique it. And I said, no, that's what I need. Yeah. That opportunity is really great to say, okay, well, what fits this person or what fits this occupation? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would certainly, I'd certainly be interested in doing it. How should people reach you for that? I can give you my email address, which is hscurt at gmail.com. Okay. Uh, we, we can go from there. Perfect. Wonderful. Mm-hmm. Well, thank you so much. This has been really fun. It's been a wonderful experience. I'll put some links in the show notes so that you can find the things that you're looking for, any links to reach Hal or to read up on the theories that we talked about, any of the resources. But I'd also love to talk to you if this resonated, if you really feel like you're needing community with somebody who can understand this crisis that you might be going through, this uncertainty, somebody to support you in navigating the complexities of figuring yourself out at this stage of life. That's what I do. And I have a community of people doing that in the Activate Vitality program. So send me a message, book a call. I'll put a link to book a call in the show notes as well. As always, be brave, OTs. 